Hey y'all, welcome to Miss Clark's chemistry class. In this lesson today, we're gonna talk about lab equipment. All of the lab equipment that you would use in my class is right here on this table. You need to know the names of it. If you're in my class, you also need to know where this is found. When you come to class, I'm gonna let you look all through the lab, find all of these things. Okay, so let's get started. Let me find the first piece of equipment. Let's just start right here, triple beam balance. Triple beam balance, we all should be familiar with this. We use this to measure the mass. Now make sure before you start using the triple beam balance that it's calibrated. The zero and the line needs to line up. If they're not lining up, there is a little twisty knob right here. You can twist, twist, twist to calibrate it to make sure it starts at zero. We are measuring the mass. Now sometimes in chemistry lab, we're gonna use an electronic balance but sometimes we still kick it old school, triple beam balance. So you need to know how to use that. You also need to know how to read the measure lines. Be looking for a lesson on that as well. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. Let's do all this glassware here. We've got a beaker. Now beakers, if you'll notice, there's not a lot of measure lines because it's not used for measuring. This is kind of like a mixing bowl would be to like a baker. Chemists are going to use beakers to mix chemicals in, store chemicals in. Basically, it's just like a bowl, okay? We're not measuring in beakers. The only time you would measure in a beaker, if I said, oh, put about 200 milliliters of water, then we can use the beaker. Okay, if we move on to other glassware. Now, there's different sizes of beaker. Here's a smaller beaker. Graduated cylinder. Here's a piece of glassware that we do use for measuring. And the reason why is because look at all of these measure lines. Lots of measure lines. We use this to measure volume. Graduated cylinder. Make sure you're reading it at the bottom of the meniscus. I'll have a lesson on that as well. This next piece of glassware is probably brand new to you. This is called a volumetric flask. A volumetric flask in chemistry is used to mix solutions. It only has one measure line. Can we see that right there? This volumetric flask is only good for making 500 milliliters of solution. This is for making solutions. It has one measure line. Volumetric flask. We also have an Erlenmeyer flask. This is probably the flask you're the most familiar with. It kind of looks like a triangle on the bottom. Again, the Erlenmeyer flask, like the beaker, is mainly just used to house chemicals, mix chemicals, store chemicals, like a mixing bowl. We're not using this for measuring again because look at the measure lines. There's not very many of them. Erlenmeyer flask. Now we have a couple of different flasks. Remember we had the volumetric flask, Erlenmeyer flask. We also have a Florence flask. Florence flask, again, we're, we would use a Florence flask for reacting chemicals where we're needing to expose a lot of their surface. A lot of times these are used in distillations when we're trying to separate two liquids. Again, this is mainly just for storing and using and reacting chemicals. If you notice, there's no measure lines on this, so definitely not using this to measure. Florence flask. My last flask is called a filter flask. Filter flask, it looks just like an Erlenmeyer flask, but it has this little projection here. Again, not many measure lines because we're not using to measure. Filter flask, we're using this to filter. If you were using a filter flask, you would also need a Buchner funnel. Now we have a regular funnel, just a regular funnel that we could use for filtration, but if we wanted to use the filter flask, we would need the Buchner funnel. The Buchner funnel is shaped just a little bit different. It's got this rubber stopper. To set this up, you would connect the filter flask and then your sink should have a hose on it. If your sink has a hose on it, you would then connect the hose to the little arm. Now, not this hose. If you can see my whole table, you noticed I used the hose for the Bunsen burner. I'm gonna show you a picture of the setup right now. Before we leave the glassware, let me show you a burette. Burette, also something probably pretty new. You may have never used a burette before. Here is a burette. It kind of looks like a graduated cylinder. Now, it's hard to see all the measure lines, but there are 
a lot of measure lines. A burette is going to be used to dispense accurate and precise amounts of liquids. You would turn on the nozzle, dispense some liquid, turn it off, and since you've got all of these measure lines, you can see precisely how much liquid or solution you dispensed. A burette used for measuring, but when we're dispensing liquids. I also have a glass pipette. Now I'm gonna be really honest with you. In honors chemistry, we're not gonna use this. You will use this in AP chemistry though. To use a glass pipette, you will also need a pipette bulb. You would squeeze the bulb to open the hole as much as you could, carefully insert the glass tubing, and then you can dispense however much liquid. This pipette specifically measures 10 milliliters. There is only one measure line, so you would only use it to transfer 10 milliliters and that's it. Not a little bit less and not a little bit more. You would need a pipette with more measure lines if you wanted a specific amount to dispense that's not the 10 milliliters. Glass pipette, pipette bulb. Something else glass up here, we've got a thermometer. Sometimes we will use digital probes, but oftentimes we just use the good old thermometer. You need to make sure that you are able to read these correctly. Always in Celsius, remember science is in Celsius, science is in metric. Thermometer. Another piece of glassware is a glass stirring rod. Glass stirring rods, as innocent as this looks, and it is exactly for what it sounds like, we're going to stir chemicals with this. It's glass, a lot of equipment in chemistry are glass because glass is not very reactive. So I can put some acid in here and not worry that the acid is reacting with the container that's holding it. Glass stirring rod. The problem is, as a chemistry teacher, I would say this is the most dangerous thing in my lab. This has been the thing that's been broke the most. It is also the thing that has caused the most bleeding, the most injuries, and it's because this thing is so fragile. You're stirring it, you put too much pressure on it, and it snaps. And a lot of the times when it snaps, it jams itself right into your hand. I've had it happen more times than what you would ever guess. So I'm starting to slowly replace these glass stirring rods with these plastic stirring rods. I kind of like them. They even have this little flat end at the end. Kind of helps. Anyway, sometimes you'll see a glass stirring rod and you'll see this instead, which is not glass, but it is a stirring rod. Let's see, let's keep going. Test tube. You've used test tube. You're reacting chemicals in here. You're not measuring chemicals. We need a test tube tong. We have a test tube rack. We even have a test tube brush if we need to clean our test tubes. We've got a Bunsen burner. The Bunsen burner is going to connect to the jet. I've got a lesson, I've got several lessons on how to use the Bunsen burner, so if you struggle with that, make sure and check those out. Now Bunsen burner, we're gonna use a Bunsen burner when we need to heat things up as long as the chemical is not flammable. If the chemical is flammable and we still need to heat it up, then we're going to use a hot plate. Make sure and be careful if a hot plate is ever left out on your lab table, it could be hot. Definitely don't lay your hands on it like I'm doing. Always kind of feel with the back of your hand to see if you feel any heat coming off of it before you touch it. Okay, another really, really, really important, here, let me grab this. This is a ring stand. Most all of our chemistry apparatuses are going to start with a ring stand. Oftentimes, we're gonna use a ring clamp to hold things above our fire. So we could, you know, have our Bunsen burner here, our ring clamp, and then we want to put a beaker here because we want to heat up the solution. That's a problem. Wire gauze. Wire gauze is used kind of like a pot holder. So we would use this on top of the ring stand. Now we've got a stable situation so we can heat up whatever is in our beaker. Wire gauze. Ring clamp. Sometimes we want to put a test tube over our Bunsen burner. So we might would need to use a utility clamp. This is a utility clamp. I can take my test tube and I can, if I loosen all of these nuts and bolts, I can set my test tube. There we go. Utility clamp. We can put things like test tubes in our utility clamp. It's not the only thing. Anything a utility clamp can hold it can hold. Utility. 
kind of a generic term. If we wanted to use that burette we were talking about, we would need a burette clamp. Now remember, a burette is for dispensing precise amounts of liquids. So if I have liquid in my burette, I would need a beaker underneath and I could dispense my precise amount. A burette, a burette clamp, and you would need your ring stand. One last thing that you might would need your ring stand for and your ring clamp, you notice I'm putting my ring clamp back on, is to hold our clay triangle. Triangle wrapped with clay. Sometimes we would need to use our ring clamp and our clay triangle. If we are heating a solid, we might would use a crucible. Crucibles are made of porcelain because they can withstand really, really high heat. We are heating a solid. That's what we're using a crucible for. And so we would use our clay triangle to hold our crucible. We have a crucible. Crucible comes with a lid. Sometimes you use the lid, sometimes you don't use the lid. Again, crucibles are for heating solids. It's very, very hot. We've been heating it. It's time to get it off. We need a pair of crucible tongs. Now, crucible tongs have this weird little hole right there, and I'm gonna admit, everyone feels the need to make that crucible fit right in that little crevice. But look, when I squeeze too hard, the crucible falls out. It's not a very good way to pick up a crucible. I suggest turning the crucible tongs over and just using the little grippy part crucible, heating solids. You would need a clay triangle for that. Now, for some reason, these are supposed to take really high heat, but in my lab, they've been breaking. So I've started also getting these metal ones. So in your lab, you might see these metal crucible and crucible covers. They're going to do the exact same thing. Okay, let me see what else I've missed up here. I'm gonna put my wire gauze back up here and put my beaker. I've been boiling, boiling, boiling. Now my beaker is really, really hot. We need beaker tongs. Beaker tongs have these really big openings here and you can see that it is perfect, the perfect shape for picking up hot beakers, beaker tongs. So we had two, three pair of tongs really. Let me bring them back out. Beaker tongs, crucible tongs, test tube tongs. When we're lighting our Benson burner, we would need a striker. We're gonna make that spark and heat and light our Benson burner. Let me move some of this stuff out of the way. When we need to use our hot plate to evaporate things, we would need an evaporating dish. You'll notice that most of the lab equipments that get put into the high, high heat are going to be ceramic. We've got a ceramic evaporating dish, again, so it can take high, high heat. We're going to use an evaporating dish to separate a solid from a liquid by evaporating. We would use that on a hot plate or we could set up our ring stand, ring clamp, wire gauze and set it on top of that and use the Benson burner. A watch glass. A watch glass kind of looks like a huge contact lens. Watch glasses are used for several different things. Sometimes we can use it as a lid to our beaker if we are boiling and we don't want a lot of the condensation to escape. A lot of the times we can do chemical reactions right on top of the watch plate. It's clear so we can see what's happening. Watch glass. We also have a spot plate. You may have seen a spot plate before. A spot plate gives us a surface where we can do many reactions at one time. Many like M-A-N-Y, a lot of reactions, and many M-I-N-I -I on the small scale. Small little reactions all at one time so we can compare them. So we could use this spot plate to do many reactions at the micro scale at one time. Sometimes we will need to save our reaction for the next day. So we've got different sizes of rub rubber stoppers. These rubber stoppers might stop up our test tubes. These rubber stoppers might stop up our Erlenmeyer flask, whatever we need them for. There's several different sizes. Sometimes we need to crush our chemicals. We need to make the surface area bigger. We need to expose more of the surface area by grinding and crushing. So we would use a mortar and a pestle and we can grind, grind, grind. Now I showed you the glass pipette and the, bulb, the pipette bulb. 
most of the time in chemistry, we're just going to use these disposable pipettes or droppers. You can call them either thing, disposable pipette or a dropper. Here, I have not shown you this. This is a desiccator. A desiccator is a thing, is an apparatus where we can store reactions that normally absorb moisture. If we put it in this desiccator, the desiccator is going to keep the moisture away. It has a grease lined seal. You would think I could just pull this lid off, but y'all look, kind of freaks me out a little bit to do that. But if you shove the lid over, it breaks the seal and then you can take the lid off. You can set your crucible down in here because we just drove off all of the liquid. And then we can close it back up and our substance could dry without us worrying that it's gonna reabsorb moisture. Desiccator is for keeping moisture away from chemicals. When we're weighing things on our triple beam balance or our electric balance, we're not just gonna pour our chemical right onto the plate. We need a weigh boat. Sometimes we don't need a weigh boat. A weigh paper would do just fine. So we've got weigh boats and weigh papers, and basically it's a barrier and it keeps your chemical all together while you're measuring its mass. I have a metric ruler. Again, remember, we're using the metric system in science. So we're going to measure length with centimeters and millimeters and meters. Um, I think that's about it. We've got a wash bottle. All the time, this should have distilled water in this, not tap water, so please never put tap water in wash bottles. Tap water often has added ions, which are chemicals, so that could contaminate our reaction. So we're always going to use distilled water. Now they're gonna stop that. I also have a lab apron. I will require you to wear these when we are dealing with acids, anything that could harm you or destroy your clothes. This is just going to be a protective barrier. And then, last but certainly not least, we've got to keep our eyes safe. We will always use the wraparound goggles, the splash-proof goggles. Y'all, I'm so sorry about that noise. They're working next door, and I thought I could get done before they got started, but I was wrong. Goggles, the most important thing. You will always wear goggles when you're dealing with fire, acid, or glassware. I'm sorry to tell you, that's just about every single lab you're going to do in chemistry. Always wear your goggles. I know they're not cute. I know they make rings around your face. Better not look cute. Better have rings than to lose your precious eyeballs to some hydrochloric acid. Okay, guys, I really think I have gone through all of the lab equipment that is on my table. If I left something out, I'll insert a picture. Until next time, bye y'all.